Dear Heavenly Father, as we're gathered here before you this morning, open our minds and our hearts to your word. As we proclaim this truth found in Mark chapter 7, help us to see that these clean hearts that you have given us are to be used to glorify you. In your name we pray. Amen. It comes from a clean heart. I have a, an account that I want to share with you. It is actually in the opening service, uh, uh, series theme. And I think it really displays well what we're talking about today. And now, but by no means am I saying uh, sons or daughters are better at obeying their parents. I'm not saying that with this, but I want, to, I want you to listen to this. Brother and sister are given the same chores, the same duties, the same curfews. But they each do it for a different reason. Uh, the son on the left, he obeys his father because he wants his allowance and because he is fearful of how he's going to be punished if he doesn't do it. But the daughter, obeying the same laws, curfews, and chores, she does it because she knows her father isn't trying to control her, but out of safety and blessing, she wants to show love and trust in him, so she obeys the laws. Outwardly, would those two look any different from each other? <coughs> they look the same, right? Exactly the same. Maybe one with a bigger smile on the face, but otherwise, it's exactly the same. What we're talking about today comes from within. Why do you do what you do? What does it come from? We're going to see this beautiful illustration that it comes from the heart. Not just any type of heart, because we all have hearts. It comes from a clean heart. And so we begin by describing these Pharisees as ones who put a hedge around God's commandments. Okay, we know the Ten Commandments, right? They added over 600 laws and regulations protecting those commandments. Almost ignoring those Ten Commandments. Because they wanted to obey these laws so religiously. You would almost call these as traditions rather than laws, even though there were some punishments if you didn't do it. But here's how they made them. They made them so easy that you could actually obey all 600 of them. So not really like the Ten Commandments, right? But as, as they pass these down and they, and they model them all after God's word, they model them all after what Moses told the Israelites. So it came from God's word. But they were now prioritizing this hedge and creating this self-righteousness that they are better than others. You can actually obey all these laws and look righteous compared to other people. So now there's tiers, almost hierarchies, of who can obey these laws, these traditions, these extra laws, and who can't. And so you see this now as an example because they just thought they caught Jesus. They just thought that the, the Israelites, or I shouldn't say the Israelites, narrow it down a little more. The disciples didn't wash their hands. Some of them didn't wash their hands as tradition proclaimed they should. That doesn't mean they didn't wash their hands. Maybe they didn't do it the right way. But whatever they did, it was obviously not what those hedge laws, those extra laws were introduced to do. They didn't do it. But did you see that they didn't address the disciples? Who did they address? They addressed Jesus. Jesus, we finally caught you. We've been going and following you all the way from Jerusalem now to catch you in an illegal action, to prove we're better than you and you can be punished. He hadn't been caught yet. And he used this as an example to them of what the law really is. He answered them, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips. That's what, just outward action, just like the brother and sister, right? But their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching human rules as if they were doctrines. So who are the Pharisees, the son or the daughter of the illustration? The son, right? Outwardly, they looked the same, but inwardly, the son was doing it for the wrong reasons. And he was calling the Pharisees out and calling them hypocrites. The worst type of hypocrites because they honestly believed they were right. 
And then they started teaching other people, and it turned into false doctrine, as if it was equal to the Ten Commandments. So it wasn't Ten Commandments, there were 610 plus commandments. Whoa. If they would have read our first reading today in Deuteronomy, don't add to God's word. And that's what they were doing. Jesus called them out on it, okay? And so he proclaims that, that these were human rules. He didn't say God's rules. In fact, he didn't even call them elders here. There were elders in their church, in, this, in the synagogue here. He calls them men. You men, you human rules that you added to. You are the ones who are prioritizing something over what God has demanded, over what God has given you as a gift. He really wants them to see that what they're doing is wrong. Now, you might not know many Pharisees that came to faith, but a great example of this would be Nicodemus. Nicodemus heard him preaching, heard God's word, and went, wait, what I'm doing is wrong. He's doing it for them. We'll talk about that a little bit later. <coughs> this still happens today. Where we go too far onto one side and say, we're going to add to Scripture, and therefore we can obey Scripture better. It's really a separation of doctrines and practice. Here's what God says, but here's what we're going to do. Not that it headbutts each other, it may even look right and correct. For example, we just did one already. When the gospel is read, what did we do? We stood up. That's a tradition. We do that. Why? Does everybody know? To honor. to honor, right? The gospel message proclaimed in every service is the most important message because it can't be found in any other part than scripture itself. So when we stand, it's an honor because we know we are saved by what we're about to hear in the gospel lesson. But that can go too far. Now, I'm not saying that every single tradition is wrong, but when traditions, these extra laws we almost put on ourselves, go so far that we're hindering or even blocking people from God's word, that's where the Lord would say, we're hypocrites. We look like Christians. We look like, we look like uh, worship goers, right? But then we act internally completely different. And so we're still seeing that today. We have that little bit of Pharisee inside of us that we think we can attain it through actions. We think we can earn God's righteousness by earning the law. That's one side of it. There's another side to this problem. If, if I'm not like a Pharisee and God says, don't do all these extra stuff. Don't obey all these extra laws. What's the opposite side of the road? Well, the opposite side of the road doesn't mean I can do whatever I want. The opposite side of the road is I don't have to obey anything then because God's going to forgive me. I'm just going to do whatever I want. So if you think about the two sides here, the Pharisees are going too hard on the laws. And just in case anybody's out there going, I'm not a Pharisee though. I'm not obeying all those laws. I'm obeying the Ten Commandments. This is the other side as well. And so he even addressed it right at the end there, verses 21 to 23. I added verse 20 because I think it adds with the, the uncleanness. He continued, what comes out of a man, that is what makes a man unclean. In fact, from within, out of people's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual sin, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, understraining, immorality, envy, slander, arrogance, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and make a person unclean. Now we could sit here for an hour and talk about each one of these sins and how it affects our lives. But seeing that Jesus did it, they didn't just stop his sermon and take a paragraph for each one of those. That means there was a more important reason for why he made this list. What do they all have in common? Verse 23, all these evil things proceed from within. They come from that unclean heart. They come from the same source. So no matter if you're on one side or the other, you're a sinner and therefore you have an unclean heart. So if you are calling yourself a Pharisee or not calling yourself a Pharisee, you're still in trouble. You can't get away from the law. But there's a middle ground. There's a middle ground that we're going to talk about in a little bit. I said this earlier. And we talked about the gospel standing up and standing down. 
But you can think of different things that get in the way and burden, whether it be ministry, whether it be um, God's word, whether it be how, how God's word is proclaimed to others, that, that, um, that get in the way so that other people can't hear that gospel message, right? Um, maybe it's oh, a certain dress attire. You have to wear a suit and tie to church every Sunday. Where does it say that in scripture? Well, we're doing it for the right reason, right? The correct reason, bless you, behind this all is that we're giving thanks to God by put, giving him our best, right? But if you put the must word on there, we're making a hedge around God's laws. Traditions can get in the way like that. But like the gospel, standing up and down or dressing, that can also be a good tradition as well. It matters where it comes from. It matters what's inside. Uh, this is an interesting analogy. I, I read this in one of the commentaries. I thought it was really cool. You would never unwrap a candy bar, eat the wrapper, and throw away the candy. Right? If you think of the traditions, the hedge that humans have created around God's word, you wouldn't just obey that and throw away all the good stuff inside. You wouldn't throw away what Christ has done for us. You wouldn't throw away the Ten Commandments. Bless you. You wouldn't throw away forgiveness or grace or love or joy. That is the foundation of our faith. Why would you focus on the outside when the inside is what's important? Whether that be for your personal faith or doctrine in general, God's word in general, the same goes. It's what inside that matters. And I, I just really like, I really like that analogy. Hopefully you can help, help, help you with that later on. The purpose of traditions are to point to Jesus. Give him glory, give him honor, give him praise. If there's ever a tradition that puts praise onto a human being and not on Jesus, really start questioning that tradition. Really start thinking this question. Why am I, am I doing what I'm doing? Am I doing it for myself? Am I doing it for someone else? Okay, but am I giving glory to God in this? You can think about that in every single action that you do, every single thought that you think, every single word that comes out of your mouth. Oh, should I have said that? Did that give honor to God? Because nobody wants to admit uh, that they're wrong, that they made a mistake. We don't apply the law really well to ourselves. What's a lot easier to do is this. I said one line to it. That's okay. Yes, I know I did this bad sin. Pick a commandment, right? Maybe I thought a hateful thought. But did you see so-and-so? They punched another person. Instead of applying the law to yourself saying, Ooh, I should not have thought that hateful thought. We would rather criticize someone else, point the finger at someone else because it's a lot easier. Because who's not hurt that? Me. I'm not hurt. I'm okay. I'm better than so-and-so. Just like what the Pharisees were thinking. I can keep the 600 laws, but not everybody else can. So I, a Pharisee, am better than all these other humans there. Therefore, I can look down on them. The law incorrectly used. And so... This law is really driving it home where um, almost every single verse here is about the law, isn't it? Every single verse here is going, wow, I, I am I'm a sinful human being. And even if we realize that, we realize that the problem is our sinfulness, scrubbing our hands won't help our hearts. Scrubbing away those traditions, scrubbing away those, those little problems don't affect the true big problem that's in the center of it all. In the center of it all, that we are sinners. The problem isn't the sins. It's that we, you and I, are sinners. That's the problem. Because even as a believer, we still sin. Sinners, us, that's the problem. The last warning I want to talk about the law here is that the easy way to fall into this trap is to just acknowledge that I'm a Christian, that, that, that I go to church and someone, and someone else doesn't, that, that um, I, I know what, how Jesus saved me and so-and-so doesn't, therefore I am all good. I don't need to worry about the law. 
I don't need to worry about uh, examining the law to my own life. I'm all good. No. If we start putting ourselves on the pedestal, we're starting to think like a Pharisee already. That I am better than others. That I have earned my righteousness already. That I am, I am carefree and I don't have to think about anything else anymore. Just a warning that's kind of integrated into all this because nobody would want to be called a hypocrite. We wouldn't want Jesus to appear right here and go, you hypocrites, right? We wouldn't want that. That'd feel horrible. So just something to acknowledge and to watch out for. So where's the gospel? Did you see love in here at all? Do you see joy in here at all? How about grace? How about forgiveness? He never said that. He never mentions any love. He never mentions that, that they are all forgiven for their sins. So where's the gospel? Well, here's one example of the gospel in our text. He addressed them. He cared about their hearts so much, saw these unclean hearts and said, I want to point out your sin so that you can repent. Like we talked about Nicodemus earlier. He wanted those Pharisees, every single one of them, to go to heaven. He was trying his hardest, but their hearts were so hard and they didn't want to listen to him. He was showing love to them, of people that you and I would look down to and go, why would you even talk to the Pharisees? They're all going to, to go into hell because they are acknowledging the law or the gospel. But even Jesus showed them love and said something to them over and over again, every single time out of love. But there's a little bit more. It's an implication of the opposite of unclean. If he's calling them out for being unclean, I want to be clean. How can I get clean? I would love my heart to be washed free of all that black, yucky sin, and it's a beautiful white or red clean heart. How do I do that? What can I do? Well, we saw it in our Romans reading, but I like this passage that just addresses it a little more on the spot from Galatians chapter 2. We know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because no one will be justified by the works of the law. But if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves were also found to be sinners, then is Christ a servant of sin? Certainly not. He justified us. Our works didn't justify us. No matter how hard we try, we cannot justify ourselves. Even if we still kept all 600 of those extra laws, we still could not justify ourselves because internally we are unclean, sinful human beings. We need help. And he gave us that help. Through the means of grace. It's kind of hard not to bring up in this about baptism. We're talking about washing, the washing of hands. We're talking about being clean and being cleansed through washing. It's, it's such a beautiful image to see when the baptismal font is here and the water touches the baby's or the adult's head. That person has forgiveness now. That person's heart is clean. Not that they're not going to sin any longer, but that in God's eyes, if they were to pass away right now, they're going to heaven. That clean heart is theirs. 